Discover the best kept secrets from the leading entrepreneurs across the globe. Learn from the greatest minds in business with the MyCoder podcast. Here's your host, Sam Payne. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Sam Payne and it is a pleasure to be speaking to you today, guys, from a freezing cold, absolutely freezing cold, sunny and beautiful afternoon in the UK here. And I'm very happy to be speaking to you today because our guest is Patrick McGuinness. Now, before I go any further, if you're listening and you're in a situation where you've got a full-time job, you've got, uh, you work in a corporate world, or you've got a very well-established career in law, teaching, whatever it may be, but you still want something for yourself on the outside of your job. You still want something that's going to give you a return on your investment for a very long time without having to quit your job. Or something that a lot of guys have approached me about is they're still not sure whether they want to run their own business, but they want to get a feel for being an entrepreneur. I didn't know this was possible. I'm not going to lie to you guys because since, I mean, when I was a baby, I left school as a baby. I was like, uh, what, 16 years old, straight into a, a rubbish print and apprenticeship where all I wanted to do was earn money. I had no intention of setting up something else. I was 16, earning cash and loving life. Then I joined the army. Um, at like Literally, the, the, the day I turned 18, I joined the army. Um, and that, again, was the best part of six years of just having fun and enjoying what I was doing and I had no intention and no time really to set up anything else because it was such an inconsistent schedule I was running by. So when people asked me about this, I literally didn't really know how to advise them. I didn't know if it was possible. And then I read Patrick's book, 10% Entrepreneur. And I read this book and it really got me thinking about how people can utilize what Patrick teaches and set up systems that are going to give them a return, give them an income on the side of their normal job. Now, I won't go too much into this because like I said, guys, before I interviewed Patrick and before I read his book, I was by no means an expert. I'm still not an expert on becoming a 10% entrepreneur, so to speak, which is why Patrick's on the show today to, to educate us all. But what I will say, guys, is before this, I was completely in the mindset of, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're setting up your own business, you are all in. You literally give it everything you've got. And Patrick talks about Mark Cuban on Shark Tank. And Mark Cuban, as you know, guys, is an extremely successful entrepreneur, billionaire, has achieved so much in running with running his own businesses. And his advice is you're either all in or you're not when you're running your own business. And Patrick has seen a huge amount of success by going against this, this sort of advice and he's documented everything and he now teaches so many people how they can set up investments for themselves or, or side hustles for themselves without having to leave their job. So guys, even if this is, is, like, is something you don't think you're going to be interested in, I implore you to listen to this one because it really does open your eyes to new ways of thinking. And and this can go as well. If you've got a full-time business, I'm just going to finish up on this one, guys, and I promise we'll get into this one because it's a great interview. But even if you've got a full-time business, there's still ways you can take what Patrick is teaching and use it as another side business to an already established business. And that, that's exactly what I've done because I've got no intention of, of working for anybody else. I love working for myself. I love running my teams of, of, of guys that work for me. I love running teams of people and, and the systems I've now got in place are working really well. But what that has done, is allowed me, given me some free time where I can now invest that in something else. And what Patrick teaches here is perfect for that. So guys, get your notepads and pens out. Enjoy this one. This is the MyCoder podcast with Patrick McGuinness, the 10% entrepreneur. What's up everybody? Sam Payne here and welcome to the MyCoder podcast. Now, today's guest is Patrick McGuinness. Patrick is the author of The 10% Entrepreneur, consultant, investor, and speaker. In his book, Patrick puts a completely different angle on entrepreneurship that throws a traditional all or nothing theory out the window. Patrick, how are we doing today? Good. How are you? Good. Thank you for coming on today. I was really excited to get you on the show today, actually, because you've got a completely different outlook to anyone I've brought on the show, you know. So, before we get into your book and everything you've been up to, though, can you just tell us a little bit more about yourself and what did you do, just for the guys that may not be familiar with you? Absolutely. So, um, I'm I live in New York City, and I started my career working on Wall Street. 
after graduating from Harvard Business School, and I was very happily doing that, running around the world, making in private equity investments in uh, in country in countries like Turkey and in Colombia and in China. And then in 2008, my company, uh, which was part of AIG, unfortunately was very affected by the financial crisis. And so I needed to think about how to rebuild my career in a way that I thought would be way more sustainable and would allow me autonomy. And so I did that by using entrepreneurship on the side, uh, basically keeping a day job, but doing all kinds of things outside of my day job to create a portfolio of, of activities and investments that would always be there no matter what happened in my day job. Mm, and. You know, that's the one thing that I, I really loved about your story and because most people when they think of entrepreneurship they think of all or nothing they think of like 100% goes into setting up their own business and then as soon as they get to a certain point they leave their company they're working in and just go and work 100% in their business they've created so I mean just so the listeners can get an idea of what we mean by 10% entrepreneur I mean what is a 10% entrepreneur and a 10% entrepreneur is somebody who spends at least 10% of their time and, if possible, 10% of their money either investing, advising, or even starting new ventures on the side. And so the idea is you spend a portion of your time getting involved with entrepreneurial ventures in a way that is customized to your life and your time and your financial sort of realities. And you do that over time to build a portfolio of activities that are yours and are completely uncorrelated to your day job. Awesome, man. And I mean, that's such a, a different answer to everything other guests on this show have said about entrepreneurship. So, I mean, let's let's go back to you personally, Patrick. I mean, when someone says entrepreneurship, what does that actually mean to you? Yeah, it's a great question because I think, you know, when we talk about entrepreneurship, and I know, I sort of know what you're getting at when you talk about how other people talk about it. I always thought about entrepreneurship as this sort of all or nothing. And I started my career. So I started my career as a venture capitalist early on in the first tech bubble, so we're talking like 2000 here, and I saw both the euphoria and the craziness, and then I saw all of that blow up. And so I had this real fear of entrepreneurship and this idea that you were kind of throwing all of these chips on the table and taking this huge, as I said, all or nothing, and all in and then you could lose everything and that really scared me and so when I was coming out of business school I didn't even consider entrepreneurship because I thought you know I'm not really well willing to get on on this roller coaster and so that is the way that a lot of people think about entrepreneurship it's like you um there's a tv show you guys have I guess you have Dragon's Den and here yes. we have yeah, yeah. Shark we have Shark Tank and Mark Cuban is on Shark Tank and he's fantastic and but you know one of the things he always talks about is if you're not all into something, you're not going to succeed. And I just reject that. Mm. And I'm going to tell you why. The first reason I reject it is because it really excludes lots of people from the ability to actually start something. Because a lot of the people who start companies are able to do so because they have privilege. So they have family or they have they, – well, they'll fund them or they have um, savings or they've gotten to a point in their career where they've made a lot of money. And that's great. And and if you can do that, that's terrific. But what if you haven't? And what if you can't afford to quit your job and put everything into a venture? Or maybe you have dependents or you have a mortgage or, or something like that. Why does it mean that all of a sudden you're excluded? And so that was really what I – that was my initial feeling was how, how is it possible that all of these great, talented people were just saying, sorry, if you can't do it full time, you, you're not allowed to be an entrepreneur. And then as I thought about entrepreneurship in general and how I wanted to do entrepreneurship, I wasn't really that interested in – quote unquote, being a founder of something. I was more interested in investing in companies, backing entrepreneurs, being an advisor, investing my time instead of capital, and really getting involved as part of the team. And I believe that you don't necessarily have to be the founder of something to be an entrepreneur. You can be part of the family. You can be part of the people who are rowing in the boat, pushing it forward. Mm -hmm. And that is still a very valid form of entrepreneurship. And it also allows you to understand what it means to be a full-time entrepreneur so that someday if you want to do something full-time, you know what you're getting yourself into. Mm. And do you know what? One thing I wanted to ask you actually was, because I've got quite a few mentors, um, both that work in the corporate world actually and have got their own businesses. 
and it's never really been an issue for me but when I mentioned one of my mentors that still works in a corporate environment to a friend of mine he says but he hasn't got his own business so how can he advise you on how to run your business so did you find that when you first got into investing and helping other entrepreneurs out with their startups was this kind of a hurdle that you had to try and get over or were people kind of receptive even though you hadn't had your own business at that time that's a great question, and I would argue that I, I like this question because I think this is one of the things that I I believe is is a misunderstanding or a misperception about about the whole space is that there is some there is some uh, group of people out there who like to draw a line and say, well, if you're not a full time entrepreneur, you can't come in here. Mm. And the reality is that you can have plenty of really valid insights even though you've never run your own company. So if mm. you, for example, are starting a company that has to do with a particular industry, why wouldn't you go to people who work in that industry, even if they're in a corporate venture, to go get great advice? They have domain expertise, they have knowledge of the industry, they have contacts. Yeah, maybe they've never put out a shingle for themselves, but their their expertise is still super valuable. What I think is great to do as a founder is to say, I'm gonna mix all kinds of different advice. I'm gonna get advice from people who run their own companies, people who do not run their companies, but work in the space for the clients that I'm trying to get. Bring it all together. And that's what I did. You know, you're absolutely right. In the beginning, I actually sort of felt a little sheepish saying, oh, I can advise you, entrepreneur, when I was coming from a corporate environment. Mm. But what I tend to do, and I and this is really the way I operate, is I will show people exactly the kind of value I can add before I even expect them to want to work with me. And so I have, for example, say you're selling your company. I've seen, you know, I've sold a bunch of companies, you know, that I were as an investor and in. I was at the table negotiating the contracts. That's a skill set that is very clear that I can offer to a company that comes from a corporate setting that but is very relevant to a startup. And so I think that's what it's about. It's identifying your discrete skills that are valuable in a range of settings and then applying them to the lens of a startup. Mm. Yeah, I think that's great. And, you know, I can completely relate to that, actually. It's, it's quite relevant you're talking about that now, really, because I'm actually in a position where um, it's a mentor and a good friend of mine I, who works in the city. We're in the process of um, getting back in or investment for a, a new gym we're setting up in another city. And if it wasn't for his help and his contacts in the city with financiers and everything else, I wouldn't stand a chance of actually getting that investment I need to start up my second business. Um, so I can completely relate to that actually and I think people can learn a lot from that because I think entrepreneurs, they love to think they know it all, they lo don't they? They love to think they know everything about running that business when in fact they only know one element. There's so many elements for business they don't know about so I think people can learn a lot about what you're saying there about seeking advice for stuff that they just don't have a clue about. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I totally agree. So let's go back then. I mean you said you you left Harvard Business School and you were straight into that corporate environment and you didn't have any real inclination to actually start anything for yourself at that point in time. So what changed for you? Why did you then start looking at investing in other companies and helping other companies grow as, as an investor and advisor? So what happened was after my my business blew up uh, and I actually had like my stock in the company. I had stock that fell 97% actually. Okay. So I, I kind of blew my mind. I was sort of like, wow, the corporate America is not stable uh, despite what people tell you uh, all your life. And yeah. then, and then I started, I started looking around and I was trying to figure out where's the, where's the future? Where's the opportunity? Where can I, do some really interesting things. And I started doing a bunch of advisory work, actually. So I was doing consulting work with all kinds of people. And that was great um, because I had a more autonomy and I was able to do things I enjoyed. But what I realized was that I had no upside and I didn't own any of the things. So being, I was kind of like a freelancer. Mm -hmm. And when you're a freelancer, it's kind of like eating dinner at a Chinese restaurant, Chinese food restaurant. Like you eat dinner and then like an hour later, you're still hungry. Like as a freelancer, when you stop working, that's it. Like there's no more. And so I was looking for upside and it occurred to me having been an investor in private equity that the best way to get upside is to be an owner of things. And so that's where I started looking around and I thought where I remember 2008, the entire finance sector was basically blowing up and banks were disappearing left, right and center. But entrepreneurship was still great and it was still flourishing and I remember looking at my friends who were working at Facebook and and Google and they were seemed totally unaffected by this whole mm -hmm. thing because the, the because the digital economy and entrepreneurship was reinventing our entire 
global economy. And so I decided I need to get a, be a, be a part of this, but I don't have an idea. I don't have a venture I want to launch full time. I'm not really sure how to play this. And so let me just get involved with a bunch of things and let me learn and let me figure out and let me plug in my skills. And I really did it in a very organic way. I started with one and then another and another and another. And as I did that, I realized actually that I was really enjoy this experience of building this portfolio of lots of different things and that it, for me it was a great way to be diversified but also enjoy the opportunity for tons of upside. Mm. So it's almost like instead of becoming a, a freelancer you're becoming a consultant within your own company now aren't you but you're not having to I mean cause trying to juggle multiple investments I suppose I mean what challenges does that actually present, present Patrick I mean what can people look out for if they're looking at going down this route themselves that you've tripped up on in the past and they could um, potentially learn lessons from you in, in that respect. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. And I think when I think about what people do wrong, including myself, there's a couple of things. I think the biggest problem is that people are uncomfortable or afraid of asking for something in return. So lots of people come to me and they say, you know, help all these people all the time. I'm always making introductions. I'm always helping my friends with their new ventures or family with their new ventures. But I, um, but I, I, I don't know how to ask for something in return. And I think that is the challenge number one is getting comfortable with the idea of asking for ownership and being a partner or something. And, and, and that is a mindset shift that is very closely related to figuring out what you can actually offer. And so what I do in the book and what I try to really think about, and I did myself as I struggled with this particular challenge was how do I craft an offer? that is compelling? How do I have the credibility to go to people and say, I'm do this and I expect, you know, this in return. And so I went through a process of really thinking through what I was good at. I actually wrote this whole bio and created a pitch and started going to events and pitching people. And then I started, you know, when I would meet a company that was a good fit for what I wanted to do, I would oftentimes do something in the beginning completely without anything expected in return, just to show what I could do. And what happens usually is once you've shown people what you can bring to the table, they want you to get involved. And so people might say, well, I'd love you to be an advisor or I'd love you to consider investing in my company. And then I would determine, did I want to invest in this? Sometimes I didn't, or sometimes I didn't feel comfortable, or maybe you just don't have the money. And so you go back and say, you know, I really love what you're doing. I'm not looking to invest right now, but could I be an advisor? That's the first bit. The second bit, which is sort of the the real operational part of this, is I see people that are never put things on paper, and that is a terrible idea because uh, when when a business has no value or you're in the early stages, everybody's best friends and you do lots of things and people make promises and everything's terrific. If those aren't put on paper, the minute there's value there, if the thing takes off, people tend to forget what they said or what they offered you pretty quickly, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Like, yeah. oh, did we say 1%? I thought we said 0.1%. <laughs> oh, man, do I, 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 you have that in writing? And I've seen this, and I've made that mistake as well, where yeah. I thought I was going to get something, and the minute there was money involved, I started to think, well, didn't I, I, shouldn't I have gotten more than that? And it's really bad. And so – you need to put things clearly on paper and you must get them signed and you must have them sort of properly laid out because otherwise you're going to have disagreements and it's just life's too short to be Monday morning quarterbacking the fact that you didn't write things down. Mm. I swear, I mean, Patrick, you must have been a fly on the wall with me today because I, I was actually sitting with my solicitor today and was having a discussion about this actual very topic and he was saying he has so many issues he says about 80 percent of the cases that come back to him are the cases where business were formed on a handshake and nothing yeah. more and he mm -hmm. says it, it's just it just even if it's your best friend that's probably even worse because there's a there's a comfort level you don't want to you don't want to sort of go over that line and make things uncomfortable and say let's sign a document or something here you know so i think yeah again you're a fly on the wall, Patrick. You've, you've kind of seen what I've gone through today <laughs> again. Well, I had this happen with a really close friend of mine, and it was my fault. So I, I, I will tell you, I mean, I have no problem owning up to my mistakes. And I, we, you know, we talked about it, but of course, you know, when you talk about something, you write it on paper. I mean, my handwriting was terrible, and then, <laughs> and then we never typed it up. And then, of course, you know, nothing's exactly as you contemplate it on paper, right? So there's always little nuances, like. We talk about a range of a fee range, but it's always some wrinkle, you know, oh, well, we're not getting paid all at once or something. 
And then I was, I needed the money at the time. I was like, I was really, you know, I left my job. I was really keen to make money that month. And I had a big pay, paycheck coming to me or so I thought when I did the math. And then my partner had a different number of mine and we sat down and we were very far. And I just, and I just really, you know, I learned from that experience because it's so silly because I come, you know, I'd been in investing. I had done deals all over the world in like places like Russia where, you know, you you always write everything down 15 times and have 10 different lawyers. So it's not like I didn't know this, mm. but, um, but it's a hard lesson learned and I'm, I'm, and I, and I encourage everybody on the phone, you know, or, or listening today, I should say, have those conversations because you learn so much about yourself and your business partners and you, and it's really good to know what people uh, are like in these types of difficult conversations before you do business with them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And do you know, one very key point I want to draw from what you said earlier as well was the fact that you spend time with these companies and actually at a point of where they say we'd like you to invest you say well actually I don't really feel, feel like I can invest in this at the minute I mean a lot of people would say you're crazy you should just jump at the opportunity to be part of something that someone else is building I suppose so I mean what is the power of saying no I mean what positives have come from you turning down opportunities in the past so that is a really cool question. I never thought about that before. And uh, just to um, to explain why I say no sometimes, I and I I really detail this in in the Ten Percent Entrepreneur in Chapter Seven. I I was a venture capitalist. I still am a venture capitalist, and so I have I have a lot of experience in how to assess investments. And and I have a very structured approach, and I really put all of this into the book. So I have the longest chapter I have is actually how to decide if you want to make an investment. And it may be, but you never have 100% conviction, right? You never have, you cannot foresee the future. Like, you know, that's reality. And so even if I really like an investment, um, I may just not be quite sure. And I may say, you know, I'm looking at three different things right now. I only want to do one or this is a great company, but it's just too risky right now. It's too early for me. And I'd love to learn more about it before I consider potentially investing. Or for some people, they say, you know, I just don't do that. I don't have the money right now. And that's totally fine. It doesn't mean you can't be a part of this. But when you say no, and you have the courage to say no, and I see this all the time. People are so insecure about saying no. Oh, I really love this company. Like I, I, I don't want to admit to them that I'm too afraid or that I don't have the capital to invest or it's not right for me. But the minute you say no, you're just being honest, and frankly, it allows you to reframe the conversation because I've had companies that came to me and said, "We really want you an investor in our company," and I'd say, "Well, thank you so much. Why?" Why? Why? Do, why are you so keen to have me? Well, you you're just you really know this in, industry, and you 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 really could help out a lot. And I'll say, you know, that's thank you. First of all, I appreciate that, but you know, it's a little too risky for me this one. Mm-hmm. And then you know, but like, let's find another way to work together. And oftentimes, I'll say, fine, you know, why don't you give us sweat equity? Why don't you invest your time in exchange for some ownership? And I do that all the time, and that that allows me to balance my portfolio so that it's lower risk for me, but still get some of the upside. Mm. And okay, so we've got a, a really good outline there of, of how this can, can benefit people. And the listeners may be sitting there thinking, okay, this is something I could potentially look at doing, especially if they're in a, a corporate role or they're in a long term job. They don't want to leave, but they want to try something themselves. So, how can they go out and recognize one, what companies they could potentially invest in? And two, how can they go about actually approaching these people? Because it's. Mm. It's a whole nother process actually going out and doing it, isn't it? And it's something a lot of people probably won't know what to do with. So yes. how can they go and do that? Yes, it's a it's it's a the, the, a very common question and one that I struggled with myself, of course, when I first started. And I had this conversation yesterday with a person that I know who has a very stable job, and we had this exact conversation. It's like I have a stable job, I want to be doing this, but I just don't know how to get started. And there's really two elements that you need to work on. The first is identifying what kinds of things you should be doing. So that's really about identifying. I believe that everybody should be doing things that are at the intersection of the things that they're good at and the things that they like doing, right? Mm-hmm. Because if you're if the things you're good at allow you to be successful, so you want to invest in areas where you have knowledge and you can make smart decisions. And the things that you enjoy doing give you the excitement and the passion to actually spend the extra time looking for them, working on them, all these sorts of things. Because obviously you could sit at home watching TV all day or you could go out and find 10% opportunities and you want to have the passion to actually get off, off the couch and go out into the real world and find them. Mm. So that's part one and and that's really a, a process and that I that I, I – 
I believe is is quite easy to do. You basically spend some time really thinking about what you've done in the past and spending time. I actually suggest people write a very detailed biography of uh, what they've done in their careers and their lives and then look at the themes and then sort of cross-reference that with what you really enjoy doing and look at that intersection of the two to find areas that are great for you. So for example, I have experience in investing in companies and I'm really passionate about travel. So one of the first investments I ever made was a travel tech company, right? Mm. So that's part A. Part B is how do you actually find these opportunities? And it really comes down to going where the entrepreneurs are. So once you know what you wanna do, and you spend some time then figuring out like, how do you want to engage? Should I be a, an investor, an advisor? Which type of 10% entrepreneur should I be? And you can actually figure that out. I, there's a quiz on my website we'll talk about later, um, mm-hmm. I'm sure. But you can actually go take a test um, and figure out which kind you should be to start with, right? You can be multiple types, but you got to start with one. And once you do that, uh, you then come up with sort of your offer. You know, what are you looking to do? You want to give capital? You want to give time? Do you want to start something? And then you engage on a structured process. It's a really, you know, it's sort of like a, a, I have a, a plan that I developed. You go on a structured process. And, and, and if you want to find opportunities, you need to go where entrepreneurs are. So entrepreneurs congregate in all kinds of different areas. There are lots of groups all over the world where entrepreneurs get together that anybody can go to. If you go to meetup.com, you can find specific groups for any type of entrepreneur. You can join an angel an investment group, for example. And there are over 300 in the U.S. There are hundreds more worldwide where people get together and pool their money so you can actually learn from other people. You can go to universities. And also what I do a lot of is I just tell people everywhere I go what I do and what I'm looking to do and people send me opportunities all the time. And uh, what's really interesting, and I, I'm going to ask everybody to trust me on this one, but um, I hope it's sort of intellectually um, something that you can conceive uh, as being true, is that once you get one, you get mo- it, it, that's it. It's sort of like it's the first one is the hardest and once you get one, it's much easier to get the next and the next and the next because you have a track record and because entrepreneurs talk and if you do a good job, somebody will refer you. And so uh, what a lot of times what happens, for example, is and I see this with people who have, you know, for example, you design websites or you're a graphic designer or you are a, um, a marketing person and you say, I want to do advisory. I want to trade my time for ownership in companies. So you actually go out and start talking to people and say, you know, w- w- I'm willing to, you know, at times do this for equity instead of for cash. Mm-hmm. And you start talking to people and then you'll start getting over time proposals, but you just need to put it out there. And then it's up to you to determine whether or not a discrete opportunity makes sense for you or not. Mm. Awesome. And one thing, you know, one, one barracks, I mean, I've, I do a lot of work with startups and one thing that startups... I don't, I don't know why they do this, but they seem to try and hold on to every penny they have. They don't like to, to let what they've got go for some reason. And I don't know why, it's just of late, the last few clients I've had. But it just seems that they don't want to invest in anything too much at the start. Now, if they're looking at someone to come on board and invest in them, mm. should they be looking for investment? Or if it's something they're not sure themselves they're not sure exactly where it's going to go. Should they look more for the sweat equity route where the person comes in and just offers their time and they give something in return for time? I mean, what? And let's look at it from the person's point of view who's been offered an investment. That's what I'm getting at here. What, what, what should people have been offered investment? How should they look at this? So one of the great things about our current startup environment is that the cost of building a business has declined dramatically mm. over the last decade. So when I started my career as a venture capitalist in 2000, it was building a website costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. I know it sounds <laughs> yeah. crazy. I know, yeah. I know. It's, you know people <laughs> are like, that's not possible. Uh, it really was. And I was looking at some stats. And I, a gig of storage in, the, I think it was 2006 or something, cost like $8,000. Today it's basically free. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the iPhone is less than 10 years old, right? Um, so you think about how something that could have cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars just 10 or 15 years ago, now is basically free, which is crazy. Yeah. And if you read The Lean Startup, uh, which is one of my sort yeah. of favorite books in this space, it teaches you how to test and try ideas very cheaply. And so as a result, I am I always tell entrepreneurs like 
try to wait as long as possible to raise capital. Like there's no – everybody talks about, oh, raising capital, it's so glamorous, oh, venture capital, blah, blah, blah. That is all great. But, you know, the reality is the more you can own of your business for as long as possible, the better for you because you maintain control. So as a result, I encourage people to bring in talent for free. And to when you're a startup, right, you can't afford to hire people full time. You just can't. Like you've got to all be working on a bunch of stuff. So extend your team by bringing on people's advisors who can give you some of their time for free, help you find investors, help you find clients, help you find great other talent um, on a very uh, basically free basis. For obviously equity, but you're aligning the incentives, and you're also potentially building a group of people who maybe when it's time to raise money, interested in investing. So it really creates, for me, it creates momentum and it's a great way to increase the chances of success for your business uh, without selling any of the shares. Mm. That's, that's incredible advice. And let's flip this then to the person who's listening today and thinking, okay, I'd like to actually approach startups and offer my services or offer investment here. So for one, if they haven't got the capital to invest, you said they're just offering your services in return for equity is a very good way for doing this. So if if someone's there and they have got capital and they're not sure about investing the capital, is it advisable just to go in with the services straight away or should they go in with money? How should people approach this if they want to go and do this themselves? So it's always going to be a two-way conversation. So you may be very keen to be an advisor and the company says, no, thank you. We, we think you're terrific, but we're not prepared to do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. Um, which which can happen, and 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 that's fine. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's nothing to be done there, but it does mean that you've got to have, you know, have that conversation. What I tend to do, my so my sweet spot where I love to operate, and if I can do it, I do it, is to combine the two and say I'd love to invest something because I believe in you, but I'd also like to be an advisor because I want to be involved, mm -hmm. and I want to be involved more than just a little bit, and so I need to make that worth my time. And I want my investment to have a greater sort of upside so I can really make each dollar count for more. So that's the ideal space to be in for me personally. That said, it really depends on the situation. So very early stage ventures, I tend to not be interested in investing because it's just the risk is pretty high and because – there's just not enough visibility for me in terms of like, does the model work or not? And then later on, as companies become more established, typically they offer, you know, once a company has a lower risk level, they're less willing to offer equity to advisors or they'll offer far less. And so the upside is, 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 is um, excuse me, to advisors. So, there, so there's like less upside there. And um, the opportunity to invest is more, is more sort of desirable to them. And so it just depends. But what it comes down to is, it depends on you, right, as the person who wants to be the 10% entrepreneur. Because I have these conversations all the time with, this depends on you. Like some people are very busy, but they have plenty of money to invest. And they're looking to be part of startups for the excitement, for the experience, and for the upside. But they're saying, you know, I just don't have the time to be an advisor. So that will, that's just not a fit for them. They're better to be an angel. Mm. Um, and maybe someday down the line when they have more time, then they can do advisory as well. For other people, they, you know, very keen, but they don't have the capital. And so they need to be an advisor. But maybe down the line, they'll have more capital and it can be angels as well. And so that's what I talked at the beginning of our conversation. What I mentioned about 10% entrepreneurship is it's really about customizing entrepreneurship to where you are in your life and what your mm -hmm. skills are. And so therefore, this may change over time and you just need to sit down and go through, I mean, I, I would encourage you to do all the exercises in the book three times over and think about how they determine where you're going to actually end up as a 10%er. Yeah, and I mean, so how many, let's, let's go back to yourself now, Patrick. I mean, you've been doing this for a, a while now. So how many businesses have you got in your portfolio at the minute? So I have been doing this for five over five years, which is mm -hmm. amazing. I can't even believe it. And I have I the last time I counted, um, and I should count again, but it was around twenty one. Yeah. And of that twenty one, I have about I believe sixteen or seventeen startups. Sixteen startups, of which about half are capital, half are advisor or combined. I had I think four real estate projects mm -hmm. and I my most my most recent funkiest one I think is uh, I invested in a play okay. that's going to be produced in London next year so 
you know, we'll we'll have you over. Oh. It's going to be the London production of The Last King of Scotland, hopefully going to the West End. So that's uh, more of a creative investment, but actually really cool, potentially very lucrative investment as well. Yeah, that's that's awesome. That's really cool. I've never heard anyone say they've invested in a play before. That's amazing. Yeah, it was. People look at me like I'm like kind of crazy because they think <laughs> think you think of that one and you're sort of like, man, that sounds very high risk. And I will tell you, I did my homework on this one, and it wasn't that I I don't believe in investing in things where you don't have any knowledge. So I did a lot of homework, and I I got the opportunity through my literary agent, mm-hmm. who's based in London, and I then talked to the producers and I talked to people who'd done this kind of investing, and um and the way that the investment structured actually it's a pretty good deal. And I also didn't put tons of money into it, so I had a limited amount. And so I did it partially as an investment, partially for the life experience. And then it's been great. I just had lunch over in London with the um, the person who wrote the book, The Last King of Scotland, Giles Foden. So mm-hmm. I've had part of my returns have also been not just financial, but meeting awesome people and having life experiences that, that are important to me. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's amazing. I think it's amazing. And I mean, before we wrap this up, I'd like to actually go back to your services that you offer now as a result of everything you've done in this past five years because I mean I'm just looking at your site now and you've got and when I was doing my research I actually found myself immersed in a lot of the stuff in your site for quite a while um, quite a bit longer than I would anybody else because one the concept was completely new to me the Tempson Entrepreneur so I was very interested in it anyway but how have things been for you since you've really started gaining traction with this I mean at what point did you go do you know what I need to make this an online platform where I've got my books my quizzes all my resources my blog how did that develop into what you've got online now as patchmcginnis.com that's a really thank you first of all it's very nice of you to say and what I what I can promise you Sam is that we're about to relaunch everything like in the next two weeks so it's going to be if you liked what you saw today Mm-hmm. There'll be even more, and it's going to be um, it's going to be even better. Okay. So, what I learned it's it's a great question, and, and I don't stop back to think about this enough. What, what's happened is this began as a very much a very very sideline thing where I was doing one investment, and it's gotten to the point now where I have so much deal flow coming in that I actually have a group of people that I just send stuff to, and I say I'm too busy for this. Do you want to do it? So I actually have this like ten percent group around me of people that I trust and who I'm trying, I'm really committed to making everybody I know a 10% entrepreneur. And so I see things and I send them to other people all the time. In terms of the book, so I got the book, um, I got the book deal a couple years ago, and which is a whole story unto itself. But when the book came out, I realized that it is, a book is an entrepreneurial venture, especially these days, because in the old days, from what I understand, you wrote a book and then it went to the bookstore and it sold and you know that was the end of the day. Nowadays, it's really on you. And so even though I have a great publisher in Penguin and they've been awesome, I have to be out there promoting it. And it's part of what I do as a business. And it's very much one of my 10%. And so what I wanted to do is, first of all, I just believe in this idea and I want everybody to be doing this because I think it's – I just lived it and it's. I think it's an amazing thing to do for yourself. Mm. But second of all is that I wanted to create a place – where I just believe this is something that is going to continue and it's a movement and I wanted to create a place where people could find as many resources as possible and use that as a basis to launch into lots of other things, whether it be YouTube or whether it be another book or whether it be speaking. And so that's been my mindset um, and I've invested in that personally and I actually have this awesome, I came up with this really um elegant solution for me which is that I so I speak Spanish fluently and much of my career has been in Latin America Mm -hmm. and I wanted to create all my media assets not only in English but in Spanish and I was able to find a a firm based out of Caracas that does everything for me both languages it it, it really they help me do everything and so it's it's been powerful for me because doing these things as you know and anybody who's I mean this like social media just managing social media is such uh, it's tons of time right yeah a full-time job And so I find that having um, this team of people to help me out with my site has been really transformational. Yeah. Uh, Do you know what? Again, the fly on the wall. I've literally just hired um, a full-time VA, actually, who's taken about 30 hours a week worth of work off my hands. Um, It was crazy. When I did up the work, the, the amount of work I put into my site promoting put my podcast together, it was like 30 hours, which was just an incredible amount of time. And I thought, wow, I've... It's not time wasted because it's crucial that I learned those processes, but mm. 
I've inv- I, no, I can now invest that time so much better <laughs> in my business um, just through taking on that help. So yeah, again, fly on the wall. You, you, it's one of those things. And I, I love the, um, I think it's the story I heard from you about um, the book itself come from the term FOMO, right? That's how you got recognized from the book. Is that right? Yeah. So what happened was I I had this book proposal out there and I were working on it and I really believed in it. But it's really hard to get a publisher to take any interest in you when you're not sort of a really well-known person. So if I had been sort of like some celebrity, I don't know, Donald Trumpian type celebrity, God forbid, it would have been, yeah, yeah. I, the, the book would have been, by the way, it's election day for in America. Yeah, for all oh, yeah, good luck. So I have, I'm going to, I know I'm about to go, I'm going to vote after this, by the way. Um, yeah. But uh, had I had that kind of profile or I was a financial journalist, it wouldn't have, not have been a problem. But as somebody who did not, getting a, a publisher interested is really tough. And then uh, in the middle of this whole process, I got you know, a call from a journalist out of the blue who was writing an article about the origins of the term FOMO, FOMO fear of missing out. And he had been researching it and he discovered – Surprising to me, actually, was that an article I had written when I was at Harvard Business School was actually the first use of the term FOMO on the internet. In fact, I had coined the term, which mm. I guess I knew that, but I just didn't really think about it very carefully. And so he wrote this article that went viral, and then two weeks later, I got a book deal with Penguin. So he, it, it was quite amazing, and FOMO in, is was something that you know, that came out of Harvard when the time I was there. So we were, you know, we created it and then went global. But you just, I don't know, I just never really realized it. And then when that article came out, that was the little catalyst that got the publisher interested in the concept. So it's quite amazing. Yeah. Uh, I would say create content. Everybody go out, and I think this is something that you hear on Entrepreneur on Fire, right? With with um, John Lee Dumas, he's always talking about creating content, yeah. right? Yeah, that's it. That's where I heard. That's where I first heard the story actually about how the, the term FOMO come about. It, it really made me laugh. Actually, it was quite. Um, despite all your efforts to get published, it was something that was done in Harvard Business School that actually got you the book deal, which is incredible. It really is. Um, okay, well, Patrick. I mean, we, we've we've run out of time today, but that was a, a great interview. So thank you for coming on. Before we let you go today, though, and get on with your voting, very important. Um, <laughs> Have you got any more, well, last parting words of wisdom for the listeners of the show? My, my sort of big realization as I talk to, because I talk to so many people now who are doing this and I've been really lucky. People reach out all the time and tell me what they're doing. And what I've seen is, you know, you just need to start small. That's really all it takes. Um, you yeah. do not need to, um, you don't need to worry about failure when you're doing something on the side so just get going start and see how it goes that's my biggest uh that's my biggest piece of advice to people and i find that i had this conversation last night just do a little bit and go Mm. yeah great advice great advice and patrick before we let you go today where is the best place for people to find you online and how can i get in touch with you so you can find me first of all, my web, 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 my web, excuse me, website is patrickmcginnis.com. We will find tons of resources. You can get a free chapter of the book, take a quiz about what kind of 10% entrepreneur you should be. I'm on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, Facebook, the 10% entrepreneur, Instagram, Patrick J. McGinnis, and even on Snapchat at PJ McGinnis 10. So all of those places and we're launching a YouTube channel. So I'm, I have a lot of cool content out mm. there, totally free. Um, I just really want people to engage, but I do recommend picking up the book. You can get it all over the world. It's in England. Um, go to Waterstones. It's there, uh, or foils or anywhere else. And, um, in the U S as well, obviously Amazon and, and Barnes and Noble and all kinds of other places. So the book, I promise you, it's not just a bunch of nice stories and a bunch of, uh, fluff. It's a very, detailed and if you really want to do this you will have what you need Mm, fantastic well patrick that was a great interview thank you for coming on i was really excited about you coming on today actually because i I love this concept and i think a lot of people will have learned a lot from today's interview so thank you for your time thank you so much i really enjoyed being here and good luck okay guys and there it is patrick thank you so much for coming on today and just giving us your time because i was just fascinated by this concept and I've used a lot of the stuff you're teaching since we've had this interview. I mean, I think we had this interview at the time of recording, guys. It was, it must have been about four weeks ago I interviewed Patrick and I mean, since then, guys, I've, I've implemented a lot of what Patrick talks about here today and it just works. It really does. So, Patrick, thank you not just for helping me but hopefully 
or coming on the show and hopefully helping all the listeners today as well. Because guys, if you can just take what Patrick's teaching here and apply it to anything in your life that you want to test out, go for, invest in, this is the show for you. And Patrick is the guy that can help you. So his contact details, guys, are in the show notes below. Check them out because um, I can thoroughly recommend getting in touch with Patrick. And also, guys, the link for Patrick's book will be in the show notes. Is or will be. It is in the show notes as well, guys. Okay, so um, that's not affiliate link, guys. That's just me recommending someone's book um, because it's a great read and I can, can recommend getting on that one too. Okay, so enjoy that one. And that is it. So... Before we go, guys, I've been getting a lot of requests lately um, for calls, for cons- for strategy sessions, and people are asking me what they're about. So I thought I'd just take a couple of minutes just to go through exactly what we go- what I go through with people and how it's helping them. Um, if you are interested and you're one of the guys that's approached me, then this is roughly what we're going to go through because with everyone that sets up a business, they've always got this idea of what they want to do and nine times out of ten it's hard for me to say what I actually deliver in a strategy session because everything's different every case is completely different and what we do guys is we just break down I'll give you the time to explain the business what it's about the business model if it's up and running we have a look at systems you have in place your sales your marketing um, your products how you how you're interacting with guys on social media how how you're reaching your audience, how you're providing value. And we just take a look at everything as a whole and we just say, okay, well, what can be improved? If you've already, if you haven't got a business, sorry, then we look at, okay, we look at your idea, but we look at it in exactly the same way, what you plan to do, what you've done so far, the research you've done. And and we take everything and we just map it out and we look at, okay, you could take this and take this in that direction. You could pivot here and go in this direction and and test that because this didn't didn't work at that point. And it could be as simple as a few minor little tweaks. And I've come off calls. I'm not going to lie. I think I'm not sure if they got much from that. And then they'll send me a message and go, do you know what, Sam? Thank you so much. That was wicked. I got this result from this, this result from this. Really appreciate your time. And that for me is just wicked, guys. Okay, that's awesome. And I provide that strategy session for free. Okay, that's something that... I'm not pitching to to get money from you here, guys. I'm pitching because there's no point in me learning what I'm learning in these interviews. And there's no point in me... And what I'm learning as well, guys, I'm implementing my own businesses and I'm seeing great results from. And I share my experiences, guys, okay? I literally share my experiences with people and, and I let them know exactly how they can take what I've learned, apply it to their businesses, and it works, okay? It really does work. So, Guys, if you do want to jump on a call, then there will be a link in the show notes below, which will take you straight through to, uh, it's my work with me page. And on that work with me page, guys, you've just got a quick link to to get in contact with me and we can have a free strategy session. And we can literally have a look at what you've got going on and try and make sense of it, add some clarity to it and, and point everything in a direction where you're going to gain a bit of traction or gain more traction, depending on where you are in your business right now. So guys, Thank you so much for listening in today. Once again, it has been a pleasure delivering this content to you. I hope you got a lot from that session, guys, because I know I did. And I'll see you next time on the Mike Oda Podcast.